to those tuning in from overseas and elsewhere. So this week, I, I have a I have something that I do. I don't know if I ever shared this before, but you know, I don't usually write the message till like Thursday or Friday because in the early part of the week, I like to watch and see what's going on and see what people are talking about. And quite often you realize there's like a theme that, you know, God's pointing to something. And so I try and if, it's, if there really is something like that, then I try and zero in on that for the message. So it's something to do with it right now and topical. So that's what happened this week. So we will go back to John and I think it'll be like that all year. We'll keep going along in John unless there's a reason to have it stepping out. So tonight you'll see that I've entitled it once I've got my glasses on I'll remember what I called it. I just called it So What's Going On Right Now. So unless you've been living under a rock you know that there's an awful lot going on in the world, right? An awful lot. In every country, if you were, if you won the lotto and had all the money in the world, here's a puzzle for you. If you could just go anywhere and hide, where could you go right now on the planet and, and be, have no trouble? Nowhere. There isn't a corner of the world that isn't in turmoil. Is there? So, you know, I'm nearly 60, so I've seen a lot of years. I know no one will believe that. Everyone thinks I'm 18. <laughs> but, you know, the world really has changed, no doubt. All of my generation will affirm that, isn't it? The world that we experience every week is nothing at all like the world we grew up in. And it's changing and not really for the better, it's changing for the worse. So if you're on Facebook or Instagram or, you know, if you're talking to people, again, you know what's occupying people's minds. You know that it's all this stuff that you're bombarded with on the internet, you're bombarded with on the news, and people don't understand what's going on. And especially they don't understand in the church. So God put something in my head the other day and I shared it with someone and I, I found myself saying that because a lot of what's going around on the internet and social media and just commentary in general, that's I'm trying to think of a polite way of putting it. It's not necessarily very factual. You know, Christianity was supposed to be about the truth, isn't it? We should be the example of sound mind. Remember the fruit of the Holy Spirit? We should be the example of sound mind, self-control, wisdom and understanding. You know, having sense. But I said to someone, you look, I bet you anything, that before long, the world will start to associate fake news and craziness with us. And I was talking to a, a friend, I, I won't name him here, but you all know him, very good, solid Christian who works in a big government organisation. And sure enough, he said to me the other day that in their smoko room, you know, lunch hour, that's the conversation amongst all the unsafe people about these the crazy Christians on the internet. You know, already they're starting to associate the fake news and the crazy stuff with us. So you know where that will end, right? Instead of it being a respectable thing to be Christian, in the end, that's what the spirit of Antichrist will do, is we'll put it into the minds of people that we are the crazy ones, you know? So we have to be prepared for that. So with all that in mind, with all that in mind, what I decided to do was tonight just do a review.
just to do like a stand back and over, like an overview of what happened to get us here so that you can understand what's happening, so that you can understand what will happen, all with one point in mind, so that you're able to stand. Because if you don't have solid ground to stand on, your mind will sink. I was just talking to Maurice before, he said that how many people in community at the moment have got, are falling to pieces. You know, they don't have any th solid ground to stand on, it's Friday. You know, and they are people who are like, you normally consider sort of together, same people, are falling to bits. They don't have God, they don't have any kind of nothing to rely on. All they have is whatever is on the TV or thrown at them on the internet. Their minds are sinking in the quicksand that is the foundation of their life, right? We should never assume that won't be us. Remember, the way is narrow. The door is small that leads to life. So we have to be alert. We have to like be quite deliberate in what we believe and what we uh, testify, how we live. Because it's easy to fall off the path left or right. I'm not trying to say, make it sound like Christianity is impossibly difficult. But it isn't easy. It's very, very easy to be led away. Especially when you have an active enemy who has all the best tools mankind ever invented to use on you to drag you into error. You know, the internet can be a great tool, but it can be an absolute curse as well. Because there's probably more garbage in it than there is anything you'd want to swallow. And things like that, right? So what we'll do is we're going to go all the way back to the early 1990s and just show you where all this came from, how it arrived. You need to be able to recognize it for what it is. And if you can recognize it for what it is, you won't be taken in by it. You won't lose heart and you won't lose your perspective. And uh, as we go along, uh, hopefully that will become clearer and clearer. So if there's any questions as I'm going along, because I'm going to fly along fairly fast, I think. But do ask, because it's such an important topic. So our goal is to end with a clear enough understanding that no matter what happens next, you will not be shaken. And more particularly, you won't be dragged along by your friends or... Who are, who are your... Who is the people most dangerous to you, according to Jesus, in the last days? Someone tell me? Your own family. You know, the, your enemies will be the members of your own house. So what does that practically mean for us? Well, you have to have your wits around you most, around the people that you normally would not feel any need to be alert around. The ones you normally trust the most, you can't assume that they're not being misled. You can't assume they're not being deceived and you can't assume therefore that the enemy won't be able to use them to mess you up. So I'm not talking about going around being paranoid as you're, you know, all I'm saying is we've been warned. So the principal family that's dangerous to us is church. You know, the other Christians. What does Christian mean? Christ like, right? So if you're like Jesus at the end, tell me who who of all the people when Jesus was here, who wanted him dead the most? <coughs> Is it the Roman? No, right? Who wanted him dead the most? His own people. That's where this comes from. So what happened to him happens to us. The false Christians will want to shut you down. The false Christians will want you dead. The false Christians will betray you to the enemy 
to get rid of you so that you won't bug them anymore. Okay? So, by the end of this, hopefully, you'll have enough perspective that if something like that is coming at you, you'll recognize it for what it is. Can anyone tell me how to deal with that, by the way? If you've got someone that's really close to you, it starts to become like an unwitting agent. Because remember, most of this will not be volitional, meaning they won't be choosing to do it to you. Because they end up in deception, they yeah. won't realize that they're being used against you, right? Pray for them. Pray for them, but even before that, why does God say that truth is so important? The whole armor of God is held on by one thing, which is the belt of truth. Without the belt of truth, the rest of your armor just falls off. Okay? The truth is the most important component of the armor of God. Truth, wisdom, understanding. So if something that like that happens to you, and someone like that's coming at you and you're from your own church, your own family, your own work, whatever, your own old friend, I've got a few of those at the moment. People have been friends for decades and decades and they've lost the plot and now they're just, you know, having a go at me all the time. So what's the very first thing you need to do when you realise that's happening? You will ask. What's the very first thing? What's that, Mix? Even before that. Here we go. Three of Conflicts, ready to write it down? Don't listen. The very first thing, when you recognize what it is, stop listening. We used to, when I worked in social work, we had a saying, you can work with the mentally ill until they start making sense. You know, the only way you can safely work with really disturbed people is by remembering that they're really disturbed. When they start making, when what's coming out of their mouth starts making sense, when they are starting to get into your head, you have to get away. The very first thing, when you realize God's telling you this person is in error, this person's not of him at that particular point you have to put a boundary you don't have to shut them up let them talk let them whatever but you can hear the noise but you know the difference between like just don't want to get sidetracked the difference between hearing and listening right so you can still hear the noise you still know what they said, but listening is where you like connect the brain and you're like absorbing it. So hopefully none of you spend time around drunk people, but I'm sure at some point in your life you will have been around people who are really drunk, right? And you know they're really drunk, and what's coming out of their mouth? It's nonsense, right? So do you feel compelled to have to like gag them so they can't talk? No. You just know, switch off, click, right? And you just let them babble away in the corner, but you don't, no matter what comes out of their mouth, you don't take any of it on board because you know that it's garbage, right? And tomorrow they won't even remember saying it, right? That's the first thing you have to do, and that's why truth is so important, because once you recognize that what's coming out of their mouth is not God speaking to you through them, it's just hogwash or worse. You just deal with them like you would if you had to sit on the bus next to a drunk person. You know, they're there, they're making noise, but you don't have to take it on board. Thankfully, we all know how to do that. It's not like a special skill that you need to learn. We're all very good at doing that. If you are younger than 30, you are expert at not listening. So, you know, all good, isn't it? Let's go back to where this began for me. So I have to, for me to talk honestly and with everything God's ever taught me, I need to 
my get what testimony talk from my particular perspective so very early in my walk i've shared these things before god started doing supernatural things and i came to understand that's because i have a science degree and like the school certificate that doesn't exist anymore but you that used to be the first formal exam that you had when you were 15. I got the highest school C mark in the entire country. What year? So far. Uh, 1979 or 1980 or something, I think it was. No, I got the highest total mark for school C. My average was over 90 for my subjects, right? So, so my brain has always been very mathematical, rational, scientific, you know, machine-like. So for a Christian, how does, how does someone, how does my kind of brain deal with something I can't see and I just have to trust or look, right? God knew that. So I won't waste time here because I've told you all the stories before, but you know the stories I've told you, those very supernatural things God did right in front of me. The first reaction in me is that can't be happening because you know the science in my head says that I I just for example the people that probably haven't heard so remember when I saw that girl lifted off the ground off the ground and thrown across the room and pinned to the floor and then a big depression appear on her like some big fat guy was sitting on her except there's nobody there. And I'm seeing this in right from me to your way. You know, so my scientific rational brain is going, it can't happen. Even the path that she went through the air is all wrong. If you throw some, if you shove someone, they should go like low and flat, crash to the floor. She went like up and then across and then down, like wrong ballistics. It was if something picked her up and threw her out, right? So everything my eyes are telling my brain, my brain is screaming, that can't be happening in front of me. So most of the really supernatural stuff in my Christian experience is near the front of my walk. Because God, I realized why God was letting me see it, because he wanted me to know that he was real. And that my, everything I had learned at school and university, all my, you know, rational scientific stuff, it was all good, but it wasn't everything. That there were things that, that well, that's why we call it supernatural, right? It's beyond natural. So there was a limit to where my science could explain things. There was a limit to where my mathematics and engineering could, you know? And that's why he gave me all those experiences. I don't need those experiences now because I had them then. So I don't care what happens. No one will ever be able to tell me that God doesn't exist because of all those things. And that's my rational response, ironically. I don't need a blind faith. You know, people tend to think that faith is like, like wishful thinking. Gee, I really hope God exists. <laughs> it's not like that for me. You know, so I straight away needed to know who he was. That's why I started reading the Bible. I didn't even, oh, can you believe this? I didn't own a TV. I love TV. But at that time in my life, I just didn't even own one. Every night coming home from work, I just read my Bible to know him. You know, because whatever any of my professors had ever told me was just peanuts compared to what I was seeing and experiencing. I had to know who is this, what is this, you know. But then I had a problem. Because the things that we were being taught at church didn't agree with what I read in my Bible at home. And I didn't understand how that could be. 
this is not an experience that only I had, but there's thousands of people. <laughs> so I'm praying, and then something really frightening happened to me. God gave me a burden. He didn't force it on me. He asked me something. And when I agreed, he gave me, if you've got your hand out, you'll see, he gave me two scriptures. Actually, he gave me more, but I've just written two of them. So, we're in Ezekiel 2, the one in the box in the middle there on the first page. So, Ezekiel 2, verse 4. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, whether they listen to you or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people. You understand what that means? God was saying to Ezekiel, and he's saying to me, I'm going to send you to my church that I was going to, to the to the elders and the priests and, you know, the youth leaders and things. Whoever. So instead of me sitting there going, why are they saying that? It doesn't say that in the scripture. God was saying, well, I've shown you that for a reason, Lord. I've opened your eyes to see that for a reason. And the reason is, you are the one I'm going to send to point that out to them. And you're to say it to them, whether they listen or not because they're stiff-necked and rebellious. If you're wondering, um, I hear in this translation it says stubborn, but originally original is like stiff-necked, and it's a reference to a donkey. The strongest muscle on a donkey is its neck. If you ever get near a donkey, just try and turn its head if it wants to look in the opposite direction. No chance, you know? So the stubborn, that everyone knows donkeys are famously stubborn, and you can't turn them because their neck's so strong, you can pull on the reins for all you're worth, and you will not be able to turn that head. So that's stiff-necked in scripture is a reference to stubbornness, pointing to donkeys, right? They're famously stubborn. That's how God was describing the leadership of the church I went to. I really loved my church. I went three times. At, every Sunday I went three to three services because I loved it, you know? I didn't want to be anywhere else. It, it was great because I wasn't there to be with them. I was there to be with God and God would always meet with me at church. There was this problem, right? Anyway, what's the second one? It's just like it. Remember, God always gives you at least two witnesses, right? So you know you're not dreaming. The second one was from Jeremiah 1, verse 17. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. And do not be terrified by them, for I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. And they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, because I am with you. I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Well, that's a long time ago now. You know, that's probably almost more than 25 years. So did what God say, said then, did it happen? Absolutely. Did they turn out to be stubborn? Absolutely. Did they listen? No, almost never. Did they try and hurt me regularly? Did they ever succeed? No. Everything God said in those scriptures, he did. Right? Incidentally, you might be asking yourself, what did he go and have me say? Does anyone like to guess what came out of my mouth? Because I'm no different now. Scripture. I would never trust a voice in my head. You know, like just... Every time God speaks to me, he gives me the scripture first. He, you know, that's what Jesus said, when the, that the Holy Spirit will recall to your mind everything that I have said. Remember, you, can't, you shouldn't trust anything unless there's at least two witnesses, right? So the Spirit by himself, if it's just the Spirit talking, 
that's to investigate that, but don't rely on it unless he points you to the word to confirm what the Spirit is saying. So whenever he would send me, it's not every day, right? He would send me when he sent me. It's always with the scripture. So I wasn't asking them to believe me. I was asking them to believe what God has said in his word. And God made that really clear to me that when they reject you, when they won't listen to you, it's not you they're rejecting. It's not you they're not listening to. Because I'm doing the scripture, God's word. Very important distinction, right? That's why you have heard me say many times, I don't think of myself as a prophet. I really don't. Because all he ever had me speak, all he had me do really, was point to the scripture and point out the glaring obvious that what they were doing or teaching was so far removed from God's word, it's frightening. Well, about four years into that, God started saying to me through the scriptures, and I won't go into them all because it doesn't matter, but he started talking about an east wind coming. Now, you all have been around long enough to know that in scripture, when God talks about a wind or a breath, what's he talking about? A spirit, right, of some kind. So, remember the word in Hebrew is ruach. So, if it's the Holy Spirit, it's ruach hakodesh. Kodesh is holiness, right? So, ruach hakodesh is the Holy Spirit, the, the breath of God, right? In scripture, if the wind comes from the east, What's to the east of Jerusalem today? Syria, Iraq, Iran, right? Everything to the east is hostile. So the spirit coming from the east meant in the days of Jeremiah that he what God was pointing to was if they didn't repent when when it was Ezekiel and Jeremiah talking. He said if they didn't repent then what he was going to send was going to come from the east. It wasn't just the people, who would that be? That's the Assyrians or the Babylonians, right? Each in their turn. The real judgment though is not those people but the spirit that came with them. You know, because the, the real the thing that really enslaved the people was the spirit that came with them. Particularly the Assyrians turn up again in the book of Revelation. Who is the of the, of the Assyrians or the religion of Assyria, should I say? Who is the one that introduced that to Israel, the ten tribes that, that God sent Assyria as punishment? They had already embraced the Assyrian religion. Do you know who is someone who's mentioned a lot in the book of Revelation? Who's responsible for seducing the people into worshipping her gods? Jezebel. So, this, so the spirit of Antichrist is associated with Jezebel, right? So God gave them what they wanted. If you want the gods of Assyria, you can have Assyria 100%. So he gave the ten tribes into the hands of the Assyrians. They were carried away, enslaved, made captive, right? And then you'll remember sometime later, the two tribes that didn't go into captivity repeated the sins of the ten tribes and ended up in captivity themselves. This time, Babylon. So back to the story. So about four years into this, God started getting really serious and had me warn them that if they didn't stop what they were doing, if they didn't return to the truth, if they didn't, you know, listen to God, then he would deal with them in the same way as he always deals with his people, that this east wind would come. And it did, because did they listen? No. They just told me to go away, they just laughed, and all of this of it. Pretty horrible time, but he wasn't kidding. And what came was what you've heard me mind about a lot, 
with that Toronto laughing thing, right? So God had warned me to warn them for at least two years. And because they wouldn't listen, he did what he said. And we've talked about that so often. And the only reason I'm talking about it now is it's the very first major thing that brings us to what we're experiencing now. It's like a key event. So if you don't know what the Toronto blessing is, you can look it up on YouTube still. It's a, it was, they called it a great revival and it's 100% demonic. It destroyed churches, it destroyed ministries, and then the damage that it started is still going on to this day. Absolutely horrific. But something really important is God always spoke to me about that, pointing to the Assyrians. So remember, for the Jewish people, it's the Assyrian invasion that comes first. So that's why God was pointing to Toronto as being in the same pattern. He said Assyria first, but he sent Babylon next. So the same order happens again. He pointed to that and he called it Assyria. We're going to learn in a second why that's so important for us today. Because you might think, well, that was the 90s. I wasn't there. What's that got to do with me? Well, everything, as it turns out. Let's look further and see why. So suddenly we found ourselves living in a Christian world in New Zealand, a church world in New Zealand, where two major things happened. First, there was a big split. If you were for Toronto, you didn't want anything to do with us. You were a tiny group, a remnant, who saw it for what it was and would not have anything to do with it. There was a split. That's why lots of churches collapsed. Because lots of people just left the churches. Because the churches insisted on going into Toronto. So the people said, well, I can't stay here then. And they left. Lots of those people have never gone back to church. They just do church, you know, just because they're too afraid from what happened. They're too afraid to go to church now. That's terrible. So the first thing is a big split, right? The second thing is, you remember I was talking about all the supernatural things that were, I, that were like normal? I thought, because I was in my whole Christian life back then, it, something happened at least every week, you know? So I thought that was normal <laughs> until Toronto came. It was so demonic, the Holy Spirit, it felt like the Holy Spirit disappeared. All that stopped. All the good stuff stopped. You know, we used to see people really healed. We used to see all kinds of, you know, Thing, amazing things of God, really of the Holy Spirit, so I could testify, it all stopped. And instead, we had that garbage up to now. And, you know, it's really hard for me knowing what God can do, because he used to do it every week, and then for the great bulk of my Christian walk, it's all gone. And all you ever see is substitute false stuff that began with that Toronto and Toronto really was just like the parent of everything that's come since so much of what you think is new isn't new at all it just goes you can trace it back to that Toronto so those are the two big things that happened big split and the Holy Spirit really doing the cool stuff the good God stuff stopped not completely They've become really rare instead of every week, which is what I was used to. Right? Very depressing, I can tell you. However, that's what happened. So we need to work out why those things happening brings us to where we are now. 
on the way, we need to look at a few scriptures. And one of these is 1 Peter 4, right at the bottom of page 1. 1 Peter 4, verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in that name, let him glorify God. Let's just pause there for a minute. First thing you need to understand is being a Christian does not exempt you from suffering. So elsewhere it says, if you suffer, it ought to be as a good person suffering at the hands of evil, not as an evil person suffering because you deserve it. Does that make sense? So you, you can't opt out of suffering, but what you choose to do determines what kind of suffering you will have. You know? Because if you're suffering injustice, if you're suffering for having told the truth and things like we've talked about before, it, yes, it hurts at the time and it's an awful experience, and it, but deep down, you have that assurance that even if the crowd's angry with you, God is pleased with you. You know? Even if the crowd want to lynch you, God's preparing a place for you because you've stood with him against evil doesn't mean you won't suffer. Doesn't mean you won't be martyred if you're in the wrong country. You know what I mean? So that's what Peter's saying here. If you're going to suffer as a Christian, he, he says, don't be ashamed. Nothing to, you know, there's no shame in having suffered for telling the truth. No shame for having been faithful. doesn't matter how angry the crowd are, it's irrelevant. In that name, let him glorify God. For, this is the important bit, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if it is difficult for the righteous to be saved, and it is. What will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. The two things we need to grasp from that, three things. The first is one we already talked about. Suffering is just part of being on the planet. So the only choice that's why he says and trust yourself to god if you're going to suffer suffer for having done right in a wicked world if you suffer for doing evil well you deserve it no sympathy you know no reward either you know it's no reward for suffering for doing evil you know you get what you deserve the second thing is and this is the one that a lot of Christians don't understand is very relevant to our story of current times. When judgment comes from God, right? We're not talking about what Satan's doing. We're talking about what God's doing. When God sends judgment, where does it come first according to the scripture? It's really important to understand. Judgment begins where? In the house of God. Who does God deal with first? His own people. First. It doesn't end with us, but it invariably begins with us. Why doesn't God start with judgment on the unsaved? On the wicked? This is a technical question, right? Why does God not just pour out his judgment on the wicked, on the unsaved? Why doesn't God destroy the Islamic world tomorrow? That's what lots of Christians <coughs> pray for. Wrongly, I might add. But they do. And they question God. You're holy. How can you tolerate this? Why don't you just send my... the Taliban or whatever. Why doesn't he do that? It's very important for your faith what I say next. Because they have the God forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. How about us? 
Oh dear. <laughs> you understand? God can be more tolerant, give more time to those who have an excuse of not knowing. But his own people who have no excuse? And I'm not talking about no excuse on your like first offence. I'm talking about no excuse after he sent warning for decades. Like in the Old Testament. So it wasn't just me warning, going back to my story. I found out it wasn't just me. God was, had, was sending lots of us with the same warning. And not just my church, but other churches, he had other people going to those churches. For at least 20 years. So imagine what God thinks of his own house where he's given his word. We have the scripture, we have a Bible, we can read, you know, and even if you go astray a bit, he sent correction, and not once, over and over for decades. What excuse is left? None. You see the difference? That's why judgment, when it comes, falls on us first. It gets to the wicked, you know, to the unsaved. They're not exempted. But it begins with us because we're the more guilty. You know? There's a second component as well. What could God do to an unsaved person to make their punishment worse than it already is? Because what is the state of an unsaved person? Dead. They're already dead. They're already you know, they have they have literally nothing more to lose because they've already lost everything. You know, if God really wants to be angry with him, all he has to do is nothing. You know, he can just let he can just send them to hell by gravity, just let them fall naturally. They're already on the way. You know. So God is far more concerned about bringing them to repentance than really it's almost pointless in punishing them. But we are different. We are supposed to be his witnesses. We are supposed to represent the truth. We are supposed to be holy. Can you remember what holy means? Set apart. We're meant to be different. We're meant to reflect him so that those other guys go, wow, that's different. You're not normal. You know? What's that about? And then you can testify. But when the church doesn't do any of the above, and worse, when it <laughs> teaches things, puts words in God. Imagine what God the Father is thinking when he's watched his own son on the cross for these people, and now they're doing that. Will he tolerate that forever? No. So, it's us first. But it includes the rest. The judgment catches up to them. But it always, no exceptions, God deals with his own house first. Always. We'll see why that's important in a second. So, back to the story. So Toronto's going along. The churches that actually went into Toronto big time, when I look around now, they're mostly gone. There's just a few hangers on, but it, it, it basically destroyed most of the places that it was in. Like, um, if you go to Elam in Wellington, it seems like a reasonably large place, right? But you should have seen it in the 90s. It was massive. And then they embraced Toronto, and it was, it's just tiny now compared to them. And that's typically what happened. It didn't, like, they didn't disappear altogether, but things that have been really big and lively, they just withered up and... Now they're just a shadow of what they were. 
Yeah. Where's that? Yeah. Yeah. It's very different now, I have to say, because they don't talk about they don't talk about Toronto anymore. Because I think deep down they understand that it was a big mistake. So, you know, of course our hope is that the remnant that are left, that God will bring them, do something with them, you know, that they learn the lesson. Actually, that's really the theme of our cooking. But at the time, so once Toronto is happening and once the, this vision in the church is happening and once all that's going on, God didn't stop talking. And what we're going to look at now on page two is Ezekiel 17. So here's the thing I want you to understand about this scripture, why it's so important. So God pointed me to this at the time, right? And he kept, for days, kept pointing me to Ezekiel 17. And initially I couldn't understand it. I read it and read it and I couldn't understand it. But God kept bringing it back. And then just when I was thinking, oh, maybe it's not really from him. I had two friends who I didn't ask them anything. So unsolicited, right? They, two different people said, do you know Ezekiel 17? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Two. And they said, I don't know why, but you need to read Ezekiel 17. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so that's God gave me, left me in no doubt. I had to understand this, right? You'll see how it's relevant in a moment. And let's first read it. We're not going to read the whole of Ezekiel 17, which you can do in your own time. I'm just going to look at a, a fraction of it, the bit that's probably of most importance to us today. So it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, propound a, a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord God. So this is a parable, right? So a parable means a story that teaches you principles. Not something that's literally going to happen, but a story that teaches you principles that will tell you about what's going to happen. Let's look at it. A great eagle with great wings and long pinions and full plumage of many colors came to Lebanon and took away the top of the cedar. He plucked off the topmost of its young twigs and brought it to a land of merchants. He set it in a city of traders. He also took some of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow. Then it sprouted and became a low spreading vine with its branches turned toward him, but its roots remained under it. So it became a vine and yielded shoots and sent out branches. But then there was a second eagle with great wings and much plumage and behold, this vine bent its roots towards the second eagle and sent out its branches toward him from the beds where it was planted, that he might water it. It was planted in good soil beside abundant waters, that it might yield uh, branches and bear fruit and become a splendid vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers? So that all its sprouting leaves wither. Neither by great strength nor by many people can it be raised from its roots again. Behold, though it is planted, will it thrive? Will it not completely wither as soon as the east wind, there is that east wind again, as soon as the east wind strikes it, wither on the beds where it grew? So if you're thinking right now, <laughs> what does that mean? That's exactly what I said back then, you know, because it's a riddle. It even says it in the beginning. Anyone care to interpret what it means? It's complicated, right? It, it's a riddle. That's what he says. Tell the people a riddle, make it say this parable. Right? 
So this is what it meant. And we know this when you read the second part of this of um, Ezekiel 17, it deciphers it, right? Gives the answer. But essentially, remember Jeremiah, he warned and he warned and he warned and he warned the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, the two tribes that didn't go into captivity in Assyria. That's what makes them special. Going back to the Toronto thing, who do they represent? The remnant that didn't go into Toronto. Oh, oh, so I, oh no, I'll come back to what I was about to say in a second. Right? So the parallel that we make to understand, so you can understand what's happening today, right? Is that what happened back in the 90s, the Toronto thing, is the equivalent of the 10 tribes going into captivity to Assyria. Only them, not everyone, there's a remnant that refused. There's a remnant that it couldn't touch. Because God opened their eyes, including me, and we saw straight away that it wasn't him, so we wouldn't go near it, right? What do you think... God's purpose was. Why does God, why did God send Toronto? Why did God send the Assyrian? It's tempting to say that he's just avenging himself, right? Ordinary vengeance, isn't it? That's it. You won't obey me. You won't listen. You, you beat up my prophets. That's it. I'm going to annihilate you. It's tempting to think that. It's not God's purpose. What tells you that is it's, remember, it's God's desire that all should repent and all be saved. Everything God does, engrave this in capital letters in your soul, everything God does is his attempt to save us. Even the judgment stuff is an attempt to save us. It might sound contradictory to you, but think about if you've got children, Think about when they wouldn't listen and you start off just correcting them with your voice, right? And in the old days before the anti-smacking rule, what happens in the end? If they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't listen. You still just keep talking. What happens? Yeah. They get they get a sore behind because they get a spanking, right? But when you gave them a spanking, was it to hurt them? No. What are you trying to do? Get their attention. Get them to stop doing what they're doing for their sake. That's what all this is about. That's what God is always doing when he sent the Assyrian, when he sent the Babylonian, and what he's doing now. It is meant to get our attention. It's meant, it's like being spanked. Because he's tried talking. He sent people like me for decades and decades to no avail. Right? Those two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, sitting there safely in Jerusalem, they saw what happened to the other ten tribes. God made sure they saw it, they knew exactly what had happened, right? What do you think he hoped they would do? What do you think he hoped they would do? Not repeat those mistakes, right? Learn something. You saw what happened to the other ten. You want to be like that? Right? But what did they do? In no time, the reason God had to send Jeremiah to them is in no time they started doing things even worse than the ten tribes. Their sins were worse than the sins of the ten tribes. So the actual outcome was the opposite of what God wanted. Instead of those two tribes going, wow, God's not kidding, wow, we should like sort ourselves out, you know? They learn nothing. 
and in no time, as I said, were doing the same things, and then they went from the same things to even worse things. With Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others barking in their ear, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. Jeremiah said to them, if you don't repent, he will send Babylon, who will be even more dangerous than Assyria. How do you know that? Does anyone know at the time, does anyone know why they didn't believe him about Babylon? Because it would be like me saying to Parliament that if you don't behave there in Wellington, we're going to send Ekadahuna to conquer you. You know Ekadahuna with a population of 50 or whatever? Poor little town. That's what Babylon was at the time. Babylon was a tiny little nothing. You know? So they just laughed. What? We're not afraid of them. We could knock them off with a blunt stick. You know? But a tiny little nothing place empowered by God is unstoppable. <laughs> so when Babylon turned up, to their horror, something that happened first, the first thing that Babylon did when God rose them up is they conquered the whole Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was the largest empire known at that time. You know, before the Greeks and the Romans, but there was the Assyrians. They conquered everyone in sight. Everyone. Except Judah and Benjamin. If you're taking notes, write down Isaiah 37. Right, it's in your, it's in your notes here. If you read Isaiah 37, you'll see what happened when Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, he had... He knew that the God that he prayed to was giving him the victory in battle. They won. Even when the odds were against them, they won. So he gave thanks to his God that his God was more powerful than the God of the people they were conquering. Right? They conquered everywhere in sight. Everywhere. So they're this massive empire. There's one place that he that was left that he wanted, Jerusalem, right, the Jews, or the two tribes. So when he comes there with his army, you might know the story, he comes there, what have you got now? Every other god has fallen to Sennacherib's god. The only god left in their known world that has not fallen is the god of Jerusalem. So he sends his messenger, there's an army of 180,000. That's a massive army for those days, right? It's 180,000 strong Assyrian army outside the walls of Jerusalem. King Hezekiah is inside. He's one of the last really good Jewish kings, faithful to God kings. And the messenger comes from Sennacherib's army, and he says, this is what Sennacherib says. attacked, my God has conquered their God and you will be you will be no different. So he's boasting against Hezekiah that my God's bigger than your God. That's what the messenger comes boasting. So Hezekiah does the smart thing because he's a righteous guy, right? He goes into fasting and praying and God tells him to go and speak to the prophet of the day, which is Isaiah. And he brings the problem to Isaiah, and he says to Isaiah, go before the Lord and inquire of the Lord what we should do. Notice how important that he's the king, right? So he humbles himself. He doesn't instruct anything. He humbles himself and asks for God to lead. And in Isaiah 37, you will read God's reply to Sennacherib. And it's really important. He says, Do you not know that it is I myself who have empowered you to win all these battles? Do you get what that means? Remember, God raised up Assyria to conquer the ten tribes. What is the power by which Assyria was winning all these battles? The God of Abraham. 
He's praying to his God, but his God is not the one giving him the victory. It's our God. God was using him for his holy purpose. That's the principle we need to understand. That's what Isaiah 37 shows you. Sennacher is an evil guy. The Assyrians were evil. The thing that Christians fail to understand. God, our God, empowered this evil force to win for his righteous purpose. Because they're, they're an agency of judgment and correction. But now they tried to conquer Jerusalem, right? So God says to them, it's me that's given you all these victories, but now you've come and said you're going to knock over my dwelling place? And he says, because you've done that, the insult that you aimed at my, at my people, it's landed on me. God took it personally. And here's the, the famous part of the story. God tells Isaiah to instruct the king that the Jewish army is not to go out to battle. No one is allowed to talk to the Assyrians. So they're taunting them from outside. No one is allowed to answer back. Be silent. Be still. And God says, because the insult has come against me directly, I myself will go out to war against them. And the sun went down that day, and the Israelites obeyed. They just stood on the wall silently. And when the sun came up in the morning, 180,000 Assyrians outside the city were dead. Struck down in the night by nobody. How do we know that's not just a favorite, like a great Jewish fable? Because they found a, a thing called a stella. Right? It's like a clay tablet. And the Assyrians were very good at record keeping. So they found in these ruins this ancient stella and it relays the exact same story from the Babylonian side about how they went fully expecting to have no trouble knocking over this last city. And the god of that city refused to surrender and came out at night and killed all their soldiers. And those that didn't die ran home to Assyria. And when they got there, they murdered Sennacherib the king. <laughs> you know? Which is God showing who's boss. So he empowered that wicked force to knock over all the rivals until it's just him and that left, and then he smashed it himself without even using his people to signal to them, I am God. There is no other. So you would think, with all that having happened, right, that those two tribes should be the most holy, the most loyal, you know, what excuse could you have for not listening to every word that God said when he does something like that? This is the same people who are now having to have Jeremiah sent to them to say, repent, repent, stop doing that. Right. Babylon instead, in the same way as he had Assyria, the first thing he does with it is smash Assyria to show that this tiny people you weren't afraid of, look, I have made them able to smash Assyria. Now they're coming to you, and you will not be able to stand. And they couldn't, right? They couldn't. What has that got to do with Ezekiel 17? Do you remember the first eagle that takes away the top of these cedars and plant, takes them somewhere else and then plants this vine in a good place and it should have prospered there, right? It's a good soil by good water. It should have put its roots down straight under it. And it's described that it should have grown into a low spreading vine. The most important part of that is the low bit. So it's meant to grow into a big plant that's very fruitful. That's a picture of like a nation or a church that's very fruitful in Christ. But being low, it's not lofty. It should be humble. You know? But even in its humbleness, it should be very fruitful. Why? Because it was planted in good soil by clean water 
and it had its roots straight inward. Then there's a second eagle. The second eagle in history is Pharaoh of Egypt. When Babylon came and conquered Jerusalem, they didn't need to fight. Jerusalem surrendered. Ever see the story? They surrendered. Right? Because after all, Jeremiah had already said that God is going to give you into the hands of the Babylonians. So there's no point fighting. You're going to lose. Right? So initially, the Babylonians did what is, was common practice in those days. The tops of those cedars that are taken away refers to the original ruling class. They, the only captives they took were the powerful, influential people and the existing king. They took them away. They just left all the ordinary Jewish people where they were. Then they stuck their own king in. And so they had a Jewish king, but he answered to Babylon. So you pay taxes, but you're paying taxes to Babylon. So you're conquered, but you're allowed to sort of stay where you are, not destroyed, and as long as you play by the rules, you can go along in peace. Humbly. That's a picture of that vine that was supposed to just spread out and be known. But the Jews that remain still had not learned. They didn't listen to Jeremiah. They failed all the time to listen to God. They came up with a plan. You know how it says in here that it, it turned its roots sideways to get watered by this other eagle that's in this very colorful, pompous eagle. That's Pharaoh of Egypt. They come up with a plan to make an alliance with the Egyptians. And that with them and the Egyptians, they thought they could conquer Babylon. Why were they wrong? Because God had already said what was going to happen. Their problem was they still weren't listening to Jeremiah. It wouldn't have mattered who they teamed up with, but they could not escape that captivity because it was, remember what we said, even though Babylon's evil, they had God's authority. They were agent in God's hands to, to deal with his own people. So you know, you, or you should know, that when the Romans destroyed the temple in AD 70, that's the second temple that's destroyed, right? What happened to the first temple? The first temple is what happened when these guys tried to make this alliance with Egypt. The Babylonians heard about it. So they came back, and this time they came back in force. And this time they didn't play nice anymore. Think you can beat us? Try this. They destroyed the city, and they destroyed the temple. And they carried off everything in the temple back to Babylon. Exactly like happened with the Romans in AD 70. You know King Herod? That's the king in Israel when Jesus is there. Is he one of the? Is he a Jew? No, he's, he's something called an Eye of the Man. He's from Edom. Right? He wasn't put there by the Jewish people. He was put there by Rome. Exactly what you see there is exactly a replay of what happened in the time of Jeremiah. So just like the Babylonians took the prophet king away and put their own guy in. That's what the Romans did, exactly the same thing. When that, when the, I don't know if you know this, but when the Rome turned up, there was no war. The, the, the Jewish council realized there was no chance of standing up against the Roman army, so they just surrendered. So they just signed a peace treaty straight away. And the deal was, we'll give you a new king, our guy, Herod. And you'll pay taxes, but you'll pay taxes to Rome. And so long as you play, play ball, we'll leave you be. You know, you can kind of rule yourself under our guy and, you know, all will be well as long as you pay your taxes and remember that Rome is in charge. Well, 
they did the, in 1870 they did the same thing as what happened back in the story they thought that they could make alliances and defeat Rome well here they were why is this important to the story and why did God stress to me at that time I had to understand this scripture even to the point of having two friends come and tell me right? it's to do with that remnant that didn't go along with Toronto. When Toronto came, all those churches that realized it was wrong and vocally said, oh, that's not a God, and stayed out of it. And they and we all saw what happened to the churches that went into it, right? We all saw how it happened. Same deal. You would hope, wouldn't you, that they'd learn that lesson? You would hope, wouldn't you, that they'd say to themselves, we shouldn't make their mistakes. We should make sure that God never needs to do that to us. You know, we should be faithful. We should be holy, having seen what happened. But there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> We're as dumb as the people before us. Those churches couldn't have what we had before because you know how the Toronto thing, God, God talked about it to me like the Assyrian. So it was here, right? We couldn't do anything about it. It's here. We had to live with it being all around us. So like I say, all the miracles stopped, all this good supernatural stuff stopped, just stopped. You know, and everything spiritual around us was that poison. We couldn't do anything about it. We should have been like that first planting. We should have stayed where God put us, put our roots, keep our roots under us. That's what we're doing in the ark, by the way, in case you haven't worked it out. Digging down for the foundation. Keeping our, keeping our roots under us. Not looking for power or whatever or knowledge or anything somewhere else God planted us in his word on the solid rock if we send our roots down deep under us to the foundation then you end up you're not you don't end up grand remember that vine is a low spreading vine it's not like a spectacular thing but it's fruitful that's what we're supposed to be and that's what those in Jerusalem would have been if they had listened to God. They didn't listen. They went looking for power somewhere else. They made an alliance with Egypt. You think how crazy that is. Where did God rescue them from? Egypt. And now when they're in trouble, who do they call to? The, the nation that previously enslaved them, they know that Pharaoh is as good as the devil. They were literally making a pact with the devil, thinking that that's okay as long as we get rid of the Babylonians, right? All of that repeated itself in the 1990s. Those churches, including the one that God was having me speak to, Although they didn't go into Toronto, they got grumbly. They weren't content because all the, you know, all the good supernatural stuff, it stopped. The gifts of the Spirit disappeared. Their numbers started going down and things were difficult, right? So they went on a fishing expedition. They went looking for new revelations. They got out looking for something new to revive them. Revival, revival. Those of you of my age will remember all this. So remember, five minutes ago they were saying that Toronto, oh, that's evil, that's no, stay away from that, right? Six months later, they're all doing the Alpha course. 
And if you've ever read the Alpha book, Nicky Gumbel, who created the Alpha course, he openly says the reason he created the Alpha course was to get people into the Toronto experience. You know? You know the Holy Spirit weekend at the end? The objective is that you get the Toronto Spirit. You know? So this is the same people who, were, who knew that Toronto was evil are all rushing into Alpha. What did God do? He sent people like me to say, get away from that. That's not of God. Did they listen? No. Next thing. Thank you. Um, Okay, I've gone a bit out of order. That's okay. So the next thing they do is they realize that Alpha is not actually working. They their numbers are going down. The church is getting smaller. There's no the miracles have gone. There's no supernatural power. How can we get? How can we revive the church? Remember how the problem of the second eagle, the problem of the where the roots start turning to get fed somewhere else. What the church is, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the people that didn't go into Toronto. The, the remnant, right? They started to not really care what the source was. Remember Rip Warren and Purpose Driven? That came from a thing called the church growth movement, right? It's not even remotely Christian. The co-author of it is a Buddhist. <laughs> no kidding, right? So, but it promised that if you do this, your church will grow like massive. Do you, do you remember hearing about Willow Creek Church? It was one of the first to get into it, right? Had like 20,000 people in their church. Used to. It's virtually dead now, right? They didn't care that none of the stuff in Purpose Driven was scriptural. Quite the opposite. They just wanted power. They just wanted numbers. They just wanted, you know, they didn't want to be that lone spreading vine. So they made a like a pact with the devil in the same way that those in Jerusalem made a pact with the sent their roots out sideways to something not where God had planted them, not the foundation of word. They went looking for knowledge, new revelation they talked about, pretty well anywhere they could find something. You know, back in those days, there was some lunatic turning up every six months with, oh, God is doing a new thing, oh, it's a new revelation, blah, blah, blah. None of it biblical. And people like me nearly going mental, going, what? And he warned, 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 and I didn't care. No one cared. They would, the classic thing people would say to me is, oh, yeah, but I know a church that did it, and now they've got twice as many people. I actually said to one guy once, he says, why don't you offer free beer and strippers? <clears throat> he goes, oh, no, I literally said that to him. And he goes, well, why would I do that? It says, well, if you just want your building full every weekend, that'll do it for sure. You know, if you don't care who's in there, if you don't care about their salvation, if you just want bums on seats, why don't you just have free beer and strippers? Way easier. 100% success. And he's like, oh, but that would be wrong. He says, well, how can you see that that's wrong, but you can't see that what you're doing It's obvious, but actually it's the same thing. So what they did, so we are supposed to be salt and light. You know? We are supposed to irritate the dead into life. You know? We are supposed to disturb the coma that the unsaved are in. 
but that let us disturb them with the truth. The gospel is very disturbing, right? And we're supposed to disturb them awake and in by our life. So the church is supposed to influence the world. What purpose driven and all of those things like it, the church growth movement did, is it says you need to become, this is the word they use, they say, you need to become seeker friendly. Let me decipher that. You need to make church somewhere that sinners like to come to. You know? So that's when church started becoming like a rock concert. You know? where the sermon was never disturbing, where you only talk positive things, the Hillsong kind of package, you know? So lights, great sound system, great musicians, positive message, lots of clubs you could join, lots of picnics, lots of, you know? Anything at all that makes sinners comfortable. The gospel is not most supposed to make sinners comfortable. The, the real gospel is supposed to disturb sinners into repentance. Right? So these churches, just like my strippers and free beer example, unsurprisingly, these mega churches get mega because they are giant entertainment factories. They never challenge anybody's sin. They never talk about repentance. They never actually give the gospel. You know, they just stop short of free beer and strippers because that would be too obvious. But what they do do is really basically the same thing. Right? And because they get big, and because that means they get a lot of money, other pastors go, I need to do that. Until it, the biggest complaint you hear today is, I can't find a biblical church. All, all the ministries that I associated with all a bombarded with emails every week from people saying I've looked everywhere I cannot find a safe church to go to I can't find a church that actually preaches the Bible only all these you know Christian nightclubs basically that's why that's why Ezekiel 17 was so important because of how it ends what did God say at the end because he's done that, he says, do you think that will prosper? Do you think that I won't just tear that up and leave it dead? That all of its fruit will just wilt? Most of those mega churches have collapsed. Even Hillsong's on the way out now. You know? So, the fruit of it, the final consequence of repeating the mistake that Judah made, thinking it could, and here's the thing you need to tune in on, because this is the key. Even when what Jeremiah said would happen, happened, Babylon turned up, they still would not believe Jeremiah. They still thought we can get around it. They still refused to understand that Babylon was God's agent and had his authority. You have to really get your head around that. So yes, it was evil, but who had God's authority in the picture? Babylon. He sent it. It had his authority, just like Assyria before them. You know? When Antichrist comes, it'll be no different. God sends it. 2 Thessalonians 2. I think I've got that somewhere. I've gone out of order a bit here, but let me just, have I got that? Oh yeah, on page five, at number two, I'm out of order, but let's just read it there. Halfway down, 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, The coming of the lawless one, Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways of, that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. That's why they perish. Now, verse 11 is the bit that Christians don't like hearing, but look what it says. 
For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the men who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Who sends Antichrist? God. The delusion arrives delivered by the false prophet. You can see the false prophet has the same role as John the Baptist. But instead of preparing the way for Christ, the false prophet prepares the way for Antichrist. It's the false prophet who does most of the deceiving signs and wonders. That's the deceiving God's reason. It's not the deceiving somebody that believes a lie. Don't they stop people from becoming Christians? Well, that's a really good point. I'm not sure if the mic would hear you. So it just got asked, if God sends that delusion, that means they can't become Christians, right? Good question. So, go back to the Toronto thing. You weren't there to see it, but I was, right? It overtook people faster than COVID did. Like, it just literally demonically took them over. Like, they couldn't think. You try talking to them, no one home. You could say, well, God didn't give them a chance. Yes, he did. For all the years he said, the warnings, the warnings, the warnings. Toronto is judgment. Those it overtook, it overtook because they were already beyond turning. God had tried to turn them for decades. Do you understand? So, so everyone that was swept away by Toronto that told you that they are they are like um, a prefigure of this situation. So by the time God does this, the people he sends the delusion on are past saving. So all his efforts to save them are before this. So he sent them prophets. He sent them good teachers. He's done everything and everything until they have not a single excuse left. And when they still obstinately Notice it says they perish because they refuse to believe the truth. So they've had the truth over and over and over and over, but they refuse to believe it. So, so the answer to your question, Maurice, is in the timing. So by the time he hands them over, God sends the delusion first with the false prophet followed by Antichrist who he prepares them to receive. It's judgment. You know? So they are condemned from that point. So their judgment doesn't start at judgment day. Their judgment already started. They, they will ne not, not be saved. You know? So God basically rules them out from being saving from that point because of how much effort he's gone to before and they would not love the truth. So that was really difficult for me because lots of people I cared about just ran into Toronto and I couldn't understand it but then I realised well they were all the same people that would never listen they just wouldn't listen no matter what scripture no matter they weren't interested and then when Toronto came along it had them like that when we weren't sure what it was we went and visited a big church in Upper Hutt that a friend told me it was happening out there so we said I'm sure it's not of God, and I prayed. It was just such conviction from God that it's not him. We said, but we should really see, you know. So we went and looked. There'd be about 300 people in the place. Every time the pastor tried to, he said, let's begin with the, you know, the word. And he opened his Bible with all these people there. And every time he tried to read the scripture, something invisible picked him up and threw him back about six feet and slammed him really violently into the wall of the building where he'd slide down on the floor. Then he'd get up again laughing like a hyena, come forward and try reading the Bible again, slammed into the wall, happened three times and he says, well, I guess God doesn't want us to read this. Yeah. I saw that with my own eyes. This is after I had to step over some woman in the foyer, who's 
rolling backwards and forwards on carpet in the doorway, laughing her head off like an insane person, who I then discovered, I asked him, is she all right? That's right, that's the pastor's wife. She's been blessed. You know? But here's the reason why I'm sharing the story is, he says, oh, let's get straight on to the important bit. So first he says, well, I guess God doesn't want us to read this or the other Bible. Is that not a clue what's going on? Then, he's, then he summons the Holy Spirit or the spirit that worked in this Toronto thing, right? And he can't remember whether he blew or he waved his hand or something around it. But all these 300 or 400 odd people standing, following this very tall, right? They're all standing, right? They all crashed over on the ground. Like you could see like an invisible hand push them over from the front to the back. They were all crashed over and all started thrashing around on the ground laughing. Couldn't stop. No, it's not that they, you know, they couldn't stop. But whoever it was had total control over them. But here's why I'm sharing the story. There's a person standing. There's another person standing. And way over there is another person standing. And we went straight to those people that were standing, looked them in the eye and says, not of God, right? And, and they looked terrified and says, no, says, just get out. Leave. Don't come back here. So out of the three or four hundred people, I think five people standing, maybe six, a remnant. You know, the rest God had given over to that demonic spirit. Bits and pieces still even now on YouTube is showing that. But seeing it up when you're there seeing it in person, of course, your spirit is so aware that there's this massive demonic presence in the room. It's just awful. It happened to us when we attended Benny Hinn in the Philippines. Oh, Benny Hinn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were all sitting there and then just Benny did and we were all playing. Yeah. But when I tried, I, I just a severe headache. Headache, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's, yeah, yeah, it's demonic. Anyway. So we have to keep coming forward to today. How do we end up where we are? Well, remember how Toronto is like an expression of what happened to the ten tribe, Assyria, right? And the remnant that didn't go into it was supposed to learn from having seen what happened so they should be the most holy people on earth, right? Having seen that, they should just be so concerned for walking straight and in the truth and holiness, right? And instead, no, they copied what Judah and Benjamin and Jerusalem did. They only learned for like one minute flat and then they went straight into the same things, only worse. So they went into Alpha, which is just basically Toronto again, Promise keepers, purpose driven, the whole ecumenical thing, the list goes on and on and on and on. And the most, the latest manifestation, of course, is the new apostolic reformation, which is just pure witchcraft, basically, right? What happens, what will happen is what did happen. Babylon is coming again. Because they didn't learn from Assyria, the remnant that are supposed to have like put their roots straight down. Instead, they've been sending out to, you know, they've been learning, they've been getting new revelation, not from God, but from the world. Like the church growth thing. All of that, all of that um, stuff that Rick Warren came up with, he didn't really come up with, the guy that came up with it is a guy called Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was the HR expert for the Ford Motor Company. He's a genius made Ford into a major, you know, multi-billion dollar company, right? He's a genius at, at marketing and he's a Zen Buddhist. <laughs> so Rick Warren went to a Zen Buddhist whose expertise is marketing, you know, pitching lies to get people to buy things. And Drucker said, well, it's easy. If you want to grow the church, you just do this and this and this. He just basically gave him secular business advice, marketing advice. And Rick Warren just 
and we'll change the words to make it sound spiritual. But basically, everyone who went into purpose driven is listening to Peter Drucker, the Zen Buddhist marketing expert from the Ford Motor Company. One of the reasons why I, I think of the pastors that are into that as being like used car salesmen. Because that's where they learn their technique, selling old cars, you know. Anyway, back to our topic. So Revelation talks about Antichrist as being Babylon the Great. The Great meaning like Babylon, but the ultimate Babylon. The original Babylon just came in conquered the Middle East, Babylon the Great will conquer the entire planet, you know, but it will be in the character and the nature and the pattern of the original Babylon, and the reason it comes is for the same reason the first one came, the remnant that refused to learn even when God did that to the other, you know, even after the, when the first thing happened, the remnant, instead of going, Praise God we never go that way. End up even worse. That's why Babylon came. That's why Babylon comes again. Is that likely to be soon? Well, look at what the remnant did. We have repeated what they did. The, the Ezekiel 17 thing, instead of being that happy to be humble but fruitful, keeping our roots under us, you know, down to the solid foundation of his word. Oh no. The church has sent its roots out to draw from any old garbage, anything that promises more people, more money, more popularity. And they brought the world into the church. What that church growth, that seeker friendly thing did, is instead of the church influence the world, the world so influenced the church that now when you go to these churches, you're just visiting the world. There's nothing Christian in them. You know, all that's missing is the free beer and the strippers, like I said. Otherwise, that's basically what they are. They'll probably, they'll probably hit someone. But, so I hope when you see that pattern, can it, you can understand why God, our God, will send Babylon the Great, he will send it, the way he sent the Babylonians. It's very important to keep, to have this perspective, or, and I'll explain why in a second, but let's shoot to, do I need to do anything here? Let's shoot to page five very briefly. Three things, three or four things we need to really grasp if we're going to be able to stand. First thing, what happened to Jerusalem was Jerusalem's fault. What's happening to the church now is, for exactly the same reason, our fault. Our fault. We just repeated the same um, problem. Why is that important? Well, on my social media and talking to people, all, not all, most of the Christians I know cannot wait to tell you what the wicked are doing. You know, they'll complain about the Prime Minister, they'll complain about this thing, that thing, the other thing, or they're passing this law, or they're going to take our free speech away, and they all true. What are they missing? They're missing this understanding. They do not still understand that this is judgment that's beginning in the house of God. The reason all this is happening is not to send her there. The reason all this is happening is not, you know, the feminists or the gay activists. The reason all this is happening is the church. The reason all this is coming on the church is the <coughs> church's own sin. Babylon is coming because of the rebellion and wickedness of God's own house. Do you understand the Ezekiel 17 thing? Because the modern church repeated exactly what happened back then, that leads to the same consequence. Is it evil? Yes. 
Are people right when they point to those things and saying, well, that's demonic, that's evil? Are they right? Absolutely. But if they just keep pointing at that, you know, I see with the camera, right? When I point, one finger pointing there, three fingers pointing here. Golden rule, right? If you get suckered into that mindset of thinking that all the bad stuff happening is because of those wicked people, you will fail dismally. You will learn nothing and you will not prevail. What's God's purpose? It's to bring us to repentance. God's purpose is to have us understand that you are no different from those in Jerusalem. You're not a special case. I've been warning you and warning you and warning you for decades, sending you person after person. People like Jacob, you know, like out there. So, not speaking on their own, speaking the scripture. So you know it's God talking. Have they listened? Will they listen? No. Stubborn as a mule. So a time comes where God does what he always does. He empowers something wicked and he gives his own house over to it. He makes them powerless under it. Do you understand? What does he want them to do when that happens? <laughs> Repent. Remember how we were talking before, like when the talking doesn't work in the old days, you could spank your, your, you know, your youngster's backside? If talking doesn't work, you could give them a spank and then they'd come to their senses. Well, this is a spanking. One that will get worse, of course, because if it is the end, like some think, well, you know, the only thing that saves you from the spanking is Jesus coming back. But if you're his disciple. But it's important for us to understand, to, to cope with what's happening, and to have any chance of hearing God and obeying him, is we have to start with that very uncomfortable truth. That even if you personally are not responsible, we are collectively, because we are collectively his house, we still bear some responsibility that his own house has got to the state it has. You know, the church in New Zealand, the church in most of the Western world is virtually dead. Almost never hear of people being saved in the churches. You just don't. No. Why? Well, God, what did God say he would do to that vine that sent its roots out? It would wither. Its fruit would fall off with them. You know, will it thrive, he said? Certainly not. Has it thrived? Certainly not. Certainly not. But that's the first lesson. We, if you want to be with God, you have to have God's perspective. You have to be in agreement with Him. It's the first thing to be in agreement with. There's no point fighting it. If you argue with God over it, you're just arguing yourself into a hole because it's reality. So that's the first thing. The second thing we already covered, that yes, the things people are pointing to as evil, they really are evil. Let's shoot over to page six. Are we on the home straight then? I think I went have I missed something. I'm missing the scripture. Sorry, I'm just looking for it. I put it. Wait a second. I don't want to stuck it here somewhere. Ah, sorry. Shoot back to page three just for a sec because I, I went sailing past the scripture that we need. It's on page three. Psalm 111, verse 10. Remember how I'll read it first. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Fear of the Lord. Where there's no fear of God, there's no wisdom. Remember what I've just been saying, what God's purpose was? And when we saw what happened with Toronto, when those people in Jerusalem saw what happened to the ten tribes, 
we were supposed to fear God, repent, and get real. Where there's no fear of God, there's no wisdom. Where there's no fear of God, people don't even seek wisdom. Because they say things in their heart like, oh, but God's nice. He'd never do anything to us. God's just forgiving. He, we could do these things and he'll just forgive us. It doesn't matter that we're teaching things that aren't in the Bible. We love you, Lord. When God has said, it's the one that keeps my teachings that loves me. You know? No fear of him. Think about those guys on TV. We don't have to name names. But you think of those huge ministries, right? Think of if you've heard any of their sermons, right? They're all upbeat, up, a big positive thing. Do they actually take God seriously? Is there any fear of God in anything they say? Is there, do they ever mention consequences? No. If you listen to them, God is a giant vending machine in the sky. And just pull the handle and he'll give you whatever you want. You know? He's such a nice guy. No matter what you do, he just loves you so much that he just wants you to be the best you that you can be. And he'll just give you whatever you need for that, right? As long as you come to this church and pay a lot of tithes. That's usually how that message ends, most of those places. You know? I remember um, Joyce Meyer. Oh my God, yes. Almost yeah, yeah, Joyce Meyer. So it's all psychobabble. What's the difference between Joyce Meyer and Oprah Winfrey? Nothing. Joyce Meyer just adds Christian vocabulary into what's the same Oprah Winfrey psychobabble. Joyce Meyer looks nuts. She is nuts. She looks nuts. Yeah, yeah. Don't have anything to do with any of that stuff. Well, we don't have any read the Bible on and just don't have to read it because it feels good. Yeah. That's why it's seductive. That's why it's seducing because it appeals to the flesh. Mm -hmm. So it seems like matter what the scripture says, there is a way that seems right, but it leads to death. You know? Yes, we'll have it. The point being though, the flip side is also true, right? The fear of God leads to wisdom. An ongoing lack of fear of God, lack of taking him seriously. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, remember that the Lamb of God is also the Lion of Judah. You know, at the second coming, he doesn't come back the same as he left. When he comes back, he comes back as the Lion of Judah, Messiah, the Son of David. He comes back as the Avenger of Blood to bring God's vengeance on the wicked. This is gentle Jesus. People forget that. He is both. So if you only have a positive message in your church, you're saying, by all means, love half of Jesus and ignore the other half. That's what they're saying. You know, because only the, only the nice half will ever come to your house. But the other half, well, let's hope he doesn't come to your house because you won't have a house if he does. He's both. And because the second coming is what we're looking to, it's a line of Judah who's coming. We ought to have a healthy respect for the holiness and righteousness of God. Right? The reason I wanted to point to that psalm is, just as the fear of God leads to wisdom, a constant lack of it leads to what I call spiritual dementia. So people that even knew stuff, forget it. In the end, their discernment goes. Discernment means the ability to tell whether it's God or not, right from wrong. So they lose any kind of godly wisdom and they get a kind of spiritual dementia where they can't even remember the things they used to know. Their discernment disappears and that's when they start swallowing things that are so obviously not of God so obviously the doctrine of demons, and yet they just they just can't see it, even though once upon a time attitude B, well, we're going to see because we have help in that department. Let's get over to page six because then we're almost 
I'm playing on. Sorry, I, I got myself out of order. Halfway down, you see Revelation 16. Or oh, number three on page six. So one of the things going on at the moment in the church is people keep talking that like everything's going to go back to normal. Church people I'm talking about. They're still talking about, um, so one of the lies that NAR, New Apostolic Revival and Dominionism, one of the big lies of it is that there's going to be a worldwide revival at the end, that there'll be an end time big revival, right? No, not true. The only big revival that happens in the, at the end is the, is the remnant of Jacob who are saved by the return of Christ. The, the Gentile church, scripturally, just gets smaller and smaller and only, remnant, only a remnant are saved. Right? All these comments I keep seeing on Facebook and, and people sitting there, like, like I said before, they're just pointing to all these wicked things as if they didn't have a problem. And they keep saying, oh, God will deal with that, God will deal with that, you know, because in their heads, they're still imagining that the kingdom of God will be on earth, like, you know, in a couple of months' time or something. You know, that we'll all go back and New Zealand will be this great Christian country and, you know, all this immorality will go and it'll be just like, more like it was in the 1960s when I was little. Because New Zealand used to be a very Christian country once upon a time. They're dreaming. Remember what we said that they just, no matter what God does, the people refuse to listen. We don't learn. We have no fear of God in the church now. Look around. Without the fear of God, there's no wisdom. Without wisdom, there's no, no one will get the truth. Without the truth, they won't repent. Some people will say, Surely God could do something so dramatic that people would realize and repent, right? Here's something that might make your eyes open. You've all been aware of the climate change conference that's on at the moment. So they're all talking about global warming and everything. That Greta, what's her name, was her, you know, crying into the microphone as we did. Is the world going to get hotter, according to the scripture? Yeah. Well, <laughs> a lot hotter than they think. Revelation 16, verse 8. It's part of judgment, right? And this won't make any difference if you've bought an electric car, I promise you. <laughs> Revelation 16, verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl. So this is after the seventh seal is broken. And the seventh seal is broken, it shifts from tribulation to wrath. So now it's God's wrath being poured out on the wicked because the rapture has already taken his own away, right? So this is God pouring out his vengeance on the wicked who remain. So the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given power to scorch the people with fire. And the people were scorched with fierce heat. Did they repent? No, they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. Pause there for a second. God who has the power over these plagues. Once again, we have to understand that although the agency is wicked, they are for a holy purpose in our God's hand. If the more you understand that, the less vulnerable you'll be to start thinking that God has somehow dropped the ball or that Satan's somehow winning or, you know, that's what Satan will want you to start thinking. That. See, your God can't save you. If you can understand it, no, no, all these things, including Satan and the Antichrist himself, are sent by God. At no point is the throne of Christ ever in any peril. They are serving God's purpose. Their very power to do these things comes from him. Just like Babylon, just like Assyria. If you can keep that clear in your mind and never be afraid of Satan, 
fear God who sent them. Don't fear what was sent. Does that make sense? They are to they are to bring about repentance where possible, but most people won't repent. Because even when this is happening, what does it say? They cursed him and they did not repent. They did not repent. Even when God's pouring out wrath on the earth, even when like, you know, a third of the waters are dried up and all this stuff. Do any of them repent? No. Revelation's really clear. The human ability to shake their fist at God and curse him instead of recognizing that perhaps I should repent. It's just maybe, maybe just maybe, God is actually God and I'm just a person. It never occurs to me. We need to see things clearly. Brings us to our home run now, which is Jeremiah 27 to 29. So we're not going to read that because we've done this in detail. But in your during the week, please just go read the, the short chapter. Please go read that again. Because what I'm seeing on the internet, on social media and things like that, the biggest problem in New Zealand is dominionism. And if you don't understand what that is, it's the other name for it is kingdom now. Right? It's the idea that the church, that God has empowered the church to defeat Satan, and once the church has defeated Satan and brought heaven to earth, then Jesus can come. So it it switches the roles. So it's like almost like us saving Jesus instead of Jesus saving us. Like, like Jesus can't come until we've defeated evil. Crazy stuff, right? But because of this idea, these people are very proud in their heads. They think of themselves as little gods. They're the ones that will go around commanding this in Jesus' name and commanding that in Jesus' name as if they were Jesus. They don't, they're not led by the Holy Spirit. They're led by whatever they think is right. And they think that by just adding in Jesus' name on the end of it makes it good. And that the Holy Spirit somehow has to obey whatever they thought of. When, you, when I say it like that, it's obvious how crazy that is, right? But it's not crazy to them. Stuff happens. Why does stuff happen? Because they have an antichrist spirit. And Satan's really good at doing party tricks to keep them deluded into thinking that they really have God-like power, right? When the Babylonians came and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple, with a few exceptions like Jeremiah himself, they left there, you know, they didn't dare touch him. But they took most of the population back to Babylon as slaves. Even when that happened, the forefathers of the Dominionists still couldn't get it out of their heads that but we're God's people. Our God is God. The God of the Babylonians only a demon. Our God is God. Surely God will destroy the Babylonians and we will be back in Jerusalem next year. Which might have sounded reasonable except that Jeremiah had been saying for decades what would actually happen. Including that if Babylon comes, your captivity will be for 70 years. A specific number. So there's a false prophet that's stirring up the people and about to get them killed in Babylon. He's about to lead this rebellion saying, Thus says the Lord, so he's speaking in God's name, God will destroy Babylon and deliver us and restore us home next year. And because it's what the people want to hear, he's got a big crowd following him. His name's Hananiah, right? And this is what you read in those three chapters. Hananiah has his modern counterparts. You see it on social media now. You've got people talking like all the stuff that God is handing this country over to. That any minute there's going to be this great revival and our God is going to defeat, you know, the, the abortion stuff and the LGBT stuff and the whatever, whatever. Adds a long list, right? 
these days you call it triumphalism. You know, that any minute we we the church will triumph over all these wicked things. That this is just a temporary issue. That you know, in a minute we'll triumph. That's Hananiah. God by His word, not by me, not by people like me, by what the real prophets said, what we call the prophecy of Scripture, what the Scripture already says will happen. That's what's going to happen. It's like when Jeremiah said 70 years. How long was it going to be? 70 years. Because Jeremiah spoke for God, not for himself. So the reason I'm mentioning this is the real Christians are going to have to get used to lots of Hananiahs in their life. Well-meaning, you know, well-meaning that they haven't believed God about what is going to happen? They haven't believed His word. They are just saying what their what their own flesh would hope it would be instead, and then they stick in Jesus' name on the end of it. Right? What did Jeremiah do? You all, all of you, I know because it's the most popular bit of scripture in the whole Old Testament. You all know Jeremiah twenty nine, don't you? I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and to give you hope, you know, give you a life and a purpose, right? Everyone loves to quote that, but they never quote it in context. Hananiah was so close to leading this rebellion that Jeremiah, who's still back in, in Israel because the Babylonians didn't dare touch him, he wrote to the captives in Babylon saying, do not listen to Hananiah, he's not a years is how long you'll be there and he said settle down be good citizens grow prosper you know increase in Babylon that's that remember going back to Ezekiel 17 where did God plant them he planted them in Babylon what did he expect them to do put their roots down under them and become this humble but big thing. Get bigger. Be fruitful. In Babylon. Jeremiah was giving them the same message. Don't listen to Hananiah. God showed them who to listen to by causing Hananiah to drop dead. <laughs> like he'd literally drop dead. But it's only after that he says you will be there for 70 years. The whole time. Because that was what I said I would do if you didn't listen. What God said is what will happen. It's in that context that he ends by saying, but after the 70 years are up, I myself will deliver you out of there. I myself will restore you to Jerusalem because I know the plans I have for you, plans to blah, blah, blah. That's the context of that scripture. First comes the captivity. Ultimately, what's happening to you is to save you. Ultimately, even your captivity in Babylon is to allow me to return you to the land instead of into the lake of fire. Does that make sense? So we have to know that this will repeat. In fact, it's already repeating. You will find Hananiah types right over the place. Remember the first rule? Don't listen. When you recognize that's what it is, first thing, don't listen. Try and correct them. They probably you know, people like this are usually beyond reason. Try, but when they, or if, or when they don't listen, don't take it like a failure. It's almost to be expected, but whatever, do not listen to them. They're not speaking for God. So our last bit, last page, page seven. We have a role model. And you because we can see how what started in the nineties, like the Assyrian thing, has developed following the same pattern. Everything that's happened in New Zealand is like a replay of what happens in this scripture with back then with Jerusalem. Babylon's not here yet, but Babylon is coming. For the same reason. The church's fault, we're his own house. It's not happening to New Zealand because of the, you know, politicians or 
gay activists or whatever, they're just part of Babylon. But it's not happening because of them. It's happening because of the sin and rebellion of the church. So where should we start? Well, let's see our hero of the day is Daniel. Sorry, just go back to the very bottom of page 6, Daniel 9. If we're going to talk about Daniel, we better know about Daniel. So Daniel 9, he is a role model for how we should be now, given in light of all these things I've been sharing. One of the big credentials Daniel had is he believed Jeremiah. Daniel born in captivity in Babylon. So he's never been to Israel. So he's a Jew born in Babylon. So captivity is all he knows, right? But he knew God. And he read the scriptures, he read the Torah, right? And he read the scroll of Jeremiah. And look what it says. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarias, the Median, that's what it means he's a Med, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldees. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. You get that? Daniel, born in captivity, knowing that he's a like a, a powerless a slave in Babylon, believed Jeremiah about what God said. So a foundational thing in Daniel's life is he knew that this would end. That this was judgment, but it was for a, a fixed sentence. That it had a purpose, it had a beginning, and better yet, it had an end. And he knew when it started, so he knew when it was going to end. Part of Daniel's boldness is because he knew how close to the end he was. You know? We need to be the same. Instead of arguing with God over the judgment, Oh Lord, you know, why does this evil have to be here? Well, now you know. Well, well why do we have this government? Well, now you know. It's our fault. The church's fault. Waste of time complaining about the agents of judgment. The problem is the church. If we could fix the church, the only way to stop all this is if the church repented. And having tried to bring that about for nearly 30 years, notice this guy not holding his breath. You know, they're so stubborn, nothing seems to deter them from sin and rebellion. So I'm not holding my breath for the church to repent. It'd be great. Right. So we are like Daniel. We are going to have to get used to the fact that our environment, New Zealand, actually it's happening globally, so it doesn't matter where you go, it's going to be the same, that we will find ourselves living in a wicked kingdom, an immoral, godless, wicked kingdom, where your faith and your God is looked down on. Where your moral standards are laughed at. Where everything that you value is treated as worthless. Because they are the victors in their minds. They seem to have the upper hand. They seem to be impossible to defeat. Why? Because for the time being, take note, for the time being, it's them that has God's authority. The same way Babylon did, the same way Assyria did. Because they're agents of judgment on a backslidden church. Not after five minutes, after decades and decades of God sending person after person to be correct. Eventually, consequences land. What you're observing is the consequences landing. So we can't, unless you know, unless you can tell me how we can get the church to genuinely repent. Remember, repentance means to return to God and his ways. That means abandoning all that other stuff that they love so much. 
Can you see that happening realistically? So we will be like Daniel. We will find ourselves living as what Jesus told his disciples they would be by the sending of lambs among wolves. Remember? So it's not actually that strange. When the church grew its most, when was the most explosive growth of the Christian world? It's in the second and third century, right? That's the same time as it experienced the most persecution it's ever faced. Under the Roman Empire, you know, Christians being thrown to the lions in the Colosseum and all that stuff. That's what you hear about, right? The persecution of Christians by Nero and all the rest of it. Well, they don't tell you at this exact same time as the church grew like wildfire, so much so that Rome itself became Christian in the end. The real church prospers when it puts its roots down under it and it's happy to just quietly grow where God planted it, even in Babylon. Do you understand? We will not be able to change the environment. So all those well-meaning church people that are on the internet banging away against those things, what they say about them is true. They are evil. But God will not move them because they, for the time being, it's a judgment. It has his authority. All of that stuff has God's authority until God's purpose is fulfilled. Being fulfilled. Not because I say so, that's what the scripture says will happen and it's happening. That's why Daniel is so important to us because he, we are in his situation. We are unavoidably in Babylon. We're unavoidably in an environment that we can't change and it's evil but we have inside knowledge. We know that it's going to end. We know that if we remain faithful, he has a plan for us in the end. That the captivity will end in unspeakable and endless joy, heaven. If, when the king comes, the kingdom comes with him. So look what he says in the rest of his prayer there. So he understands it's 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and pleading with fasting, sackcloth and ashes, humility, fear of the Lord. He sought the Lord for wisdom. Remember what's Daniel famous for? Wisdom. That's why the king of Babylon had him as his advisor. Remember? He and his friends became the principal advisors to the king of Babylon. Because that's how God kept them safe. God made them indispensable to Babylon. In prayer and fasting and sackcloth, that's humility, right? O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and faithfulness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned, we have done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, our fathers, and all the people of the land. The first thing you have to understand is Daniel himself is not guilty of those things. He was born in captivity. The reason he's in Babylon is because of what his forebears did. Notice what Daniel just did. Even though he's not directly to blame, he doesn't point the finger, he doesn't sit there on a high horse going, oh, it's not fair, you know. He owns the sin. He embraces the fact that he's part of, well, today we would say the house of God, but he's, he's part of the Jewish nation. So even though he didn't directly play a role, in the sin, he owns it. He owns it as his problem. And he seeks that, so he, he humbles himself to agree with God about that God is just. He doesn't argue with God. He's saying to God, you are right to do this. We deserve it. Now he's in agreement with God. Then he's like, lead me. 
He's, he doesn't wait for someone else to repent. He doesn't wait for the church to get right. Daniel, he leads the way. He ha- His life is a life he has some control over. So he makes sure that his life gets right with God. That is our role model. We can't change our environment, but we can lead by example, as Daniel did, of being turning back and seeking him with all our heart, mind, and strength to be his people, humble, without keeping our roots straight down under us, in other words, being rooted in the word, and be content to just grow. You know, you may not be seeing you know, it's a low spreading vine. It's not a spectacular tree. But it just keeps spreading out and it's fruitful. <coughs> That's what we want to be. Even in Babylon. You understand? We want to be, and I've been saying this for weeks, we need to be like Daniel in Babylon. Because like Daniel, we can't change our environment. Because God said that. It's a consequence of sin. So until God's purpose is over, it's there. It has his authority to be there. In the end, is it getting better? No, it'll get worse. Because what's beginning will will end with Antichrist, where the whole earth will be handed over to it. It'll take the rapture to get us out. You understand? Do I need to do any more on page 7? That's all right. You'll see that we won't... Um, need to read it all here, but you'll see one to four there. It's just repeating that in writing what I've just been saying. The four basic steps. Be like Daniel. Accept that God has been just in doing this because the sin is real. What the church did, it really did. So, you know, no, don't stand there shaking your fist at God saying, oh, it's unfair. No, it is fair. It's more than fair. It's completely just what God has done. Deal with it. Repent. Number three, there's going to be Hananias. Don't listen to them. They're bound to arise. They'll be as fake as he was. Listen to Jeremiah. Be like Daniel. That's the key. The last one, and only because God has emphasized to this me so much, and we're not going to read any of it here because it's long. So in your homework, Jeremiah 9. Before all this started, God kept dragging me to Jeremiah 9. When you read it, it'll be self-evident to you why you'll recognize God's attitude to us, the world, New Zealand. And he says what, it actually starts out, God saying to Jeremiah, he says, if I had a hotel, like a, 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 like a hostel or like a motel, in the wilderness and I could go there and hide from you I would this is God that's how much you've hurt me and disappointed me and how much I'm frustrated with you if I could just go out into the wilderness and hide from all of you I would this is merciful God wishing he could just hide from us and pretend we didn't exist that's serious right that's why what's happening is serious because what we've done to him is serious but then he says but i can't do that well he's god he can't do that he can't pretend we're not here he can't pretend he doesn't love us he can't pretend that there's nothing else he can do to try and save us so he says so you leave me no choice therefore i'm going to sift you i'm going to push you all through finer and finer mesh you know to purify you, to separate the wheat from the chaff. You know, will that be comfortable? Hell no. But he's, the key is, he says, you, I haven't done anything left. I don't even want to do it, but you've left me nothing else in the toolbox. You know? Nothing else. If you wouldn't listen to my prophets, if you wouldn't listen to my word, this is all I've got left, other than just letting you free fall into the lake of fire. So we should listen up. And we're going to end tonight 
at the very end of that scripture, right at the bottom of page 7, how Jeremiah 9 closes. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh, Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and all who live in the wilderness and distant places. All these nations are really uncircumcised, and even the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. You have to understand that circumcision is a sign of being in the covenant. So what God is saying is, you guys don't fool me for a second. You know, you fool your neighbor, you fool the other people in the church, you look Christian on the outside. But in your heart, you are not in covenant with me. You are ruled by the world, you are ruled by money or greed or whatever. You know, you don't have any fear of me or any regard for my commands. You're all fake. Even my own house, that's why he's referring to even all Israel is really uncircumcised, meaning not really in the covenant with me. So what's the answer for us then? Pretty obvious, isn't it? If that's his complaint, let's answer his complaint with what we can do. If we can influence someone else, hallelujah. We may or may not be able to influence someone else, but let's try. But like Daniel, you are you have some command over your life so don't wait for the other guy don't wait for the other girl definitely don't wait for church leadership they are a problem largely be a daniel agree with god about what's happened that he's just to do these things that he's right this complaint the complaint you'll read in jeremiah 9 Take his view about it and give him reason for joy. Remember, all heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. Even if we can't do anything about the crowd. Don't sit there on the internet moaning about what these other people are doing. That's their sin. We are in no position to point when doing nothing about the three fingers pointing back, right? If we're going to have anything to say, we should say it from the position of leading by example, even in Babylon. So that's it for tonight. Hopefully that will help you, especially once you read it rather than just listening to me, hopefully that will help you contextualize, put the give you a worldview of everything that's happening from the solid ground of his word, I promise you it'll stop being frightening. When you realize it's our God who we love, doing what he always does, being consistent, fulfilling his word, and it's actually his last ditch effort to save those who are otherwise going to perish. And we do have something we can do, like Daniel did. Then you'll stop being afraid of it. And you'll know God's peace and you'll know his presence and you'll know like Daniel did, even in the lion's den, the big lion will be in there with you, the lion of Judah. Okay. On that note, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you most of all, Lord, that you do not change, that what you've said, that what you've spoken is what will take place. We pray, Lord, for those who are still lost and misleading. Lord, those who don't understand, help us, Lord, to make them able to understand. Or you, Lord, make them able to understand if there's any way, Lord. Like you, we don't want any to perish. Lord, we pray for those who are squabbling over things that don't matter, who are arguing over what's ridiculous stuff on the internet, Lord dividing people over things that won't matter a jot in the end. We pray and ask, Lord, that somehow by the conviction of the Spirit, you would drag their attention to what does matter, even now. But certainly for us, Lord, help us, Lord, 
to be examples like Daniel, even in Babylon, until your purpose for what's happening in the world is done, until it is finished, Lord, because we do indeed know you have plans for us in the kingdom, but you haven't called us in vain. And we love you and we care and it matters to us, Lord. So we ask for your anointing to be like that low spreading vine, fruitful. Help us, Lord, to keep our roots under us, drawing from your word and not going to the world for anything. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. Good night. Shalom. Till next time.